Hi, thank you for joining us. This is Ada Bobino from the San Antonio Black International Film Festival. Um, and we are really happy to have just shown you um, a film by S. Toriano. Not really a film, it's part of a video series um, uh, out of Belize. And it's part of uh, the first uh, television series, dramatic television series there. Um, from the, uh, the series No Matter What. And so I'd like to bring you uh, filmmaker S. Toriano Berry. Hey, Toriano. How you doing, Ada? Good to see you. Yeah, really good. I'm going to change my background. Bam. <laughs> Modern technology, um, huh? <laughs> it is, it is, it is. First, I mean, uh, for Toriano and I go back from Howard days. He was a professor at Howard. Now he's retired, enjoying life and chilling. <laughs> um, but this is a film that I, I want to just talk about this because what what was pretty fascinating about this is that you developed this in a whole other country. So how did, how did that even evolve and come to life? Um, Belize, too. Why did you yeah. select Belize? Well, years ago, when I was at UCLA in film school, I met this young lady who was from Belize. Mm -hmm. And first thing I noticed about her was her accent. I said, oh, that's a beautiful accent. I said, where are you from? She said, I'm from Belize. I had never heard of Belize. Now, this was back in 1982, probably, 1982. Mm -hmm. And so she said, um, it used to be British Honduras. So I'd heard of British Honduras. And they just got their independence in 81, I believe. So, you know, it was, Belize was relatively fresh. Anyway, it was short. I think we only kind of went out, dated for a couple of weeks or so. So I lost the lady. But Belize always stayed on my mind. Because, you know, if we talk about Belize, she tell me about Belize. You know, we, of course, would fantasize about going there and hanging out and all of that. Anyway, so years later, you know, um, Whenever I'd hear anything about Belize or see anything about Belize, you know, a little bell would go off in my head, a little light or whatever. And around the early 21st century, you know, early like the 2000, 2001, 2000, I, life really wasn't feeling very good for me. You know, I did my film, uh, my uh, feature film in Balmer, my horror film, and I couldn't get it off the ground or do anything for it. And um, you know, I was still teaching at Howard and you know, I never really wanted to teach. You know, I always looked at teaching as a consolation prize because there's a saying <laughs> at, at UCLA, especially in the theater department, they said those who can do, those who can't teach, you know. And so I always kind of, kind of saw it as a consolation prize. But mm. I was always in conflict there because I was doing it. I was making movies. I was, you know, doing work, but I was also teaching. So mm -hmm. there you go. But anyway, life just wasn't going very good for me. And I really wasn't very happy. And I swear, it's just like I just heard some voice kept saying, you know, come to Belize, come to Belize, you know. <laughs> and so my initial thought was the fact that, you know, back then I had never heard of a Belizean film or a Belizean filmmaker. You know, I'd heard of, you know, films from Jamaica and Cuba and, you know, various other places, but never from Belize. So my thought was, since I was a film professor, you know, maybe I could arrange a, uh, a video workshop you know, go down to the Belize, have a workshop and maybe kickstart, you know, something, you know, production wise. Mm -hmm. And so I started looking into it and a friend sent me a link to a, uh, I guess it was a package, you know, airfare, hotel, you know, all of that for a 10 day, a 10 day, you know, package. So I said, what the heck? So I went on and purchased it mm -hmm. and I went. And before I went, I uh, had contacted, reached out, and I contacted a guy that was at the University of Belize you know, about possibly, you know, using the University of Belize as, you know, the conduit, you know, for this workshop. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I met with him and he told me that um, I had just missed the first Belize International Film Festival, oh. which was a month before. So I'm like, oh, dang it. And he also told me that um, the first ever written, produced, directed film from Belize or by a Belizean was actually premiering at the Princess Theater, which is like the only movie theater in the country, you know? And I believe he's the one that, that hooked me up with Emory King. Emory King was the film commissioner 
of Belize okay. at the time. He mm -hmm. was this older guy, this uh, older, you know, white gentleman, you know, kind of more British. He was more of an expat, you know, mm -hmm. but he was, he was a great guy. He was a nice guy. So I had uh, met with uh, Emery and I actually went to the premiere of this screening uh, with uh, he, he and his wife. And um, Kim Vasquez was actually the writer director who, who actually did it, who actually became later uh, one of the, the writers on No Matter What. Mm -hmm. So I actually ended up working with her. So anyway, so I got there and I realized that, uh, you know, I couldn't make the splash. You know, the splash had already been made. Mm -hmm. And I figured I could, you know, ride the waves and help, you know, the waves go on a little longer. So I also uh, met the guy at um, University of Belize, also set up a meeting of me with Kim Vasquez. No, not Kim Vasquez. She was a writer with um, Suzette Zayden, who did the film festival. And so I met with Suzette. You know, we talked and I told her about my uh, idea about doing a workshop. She said, well, fine. You know, he said, we can do it, you know, next year, next year's uh, film festival. So for the second annual film festival, uh, I went down and I did a production workshop as well as I did my uh, Black Vision Silver Screen Howard University Student Film Showcase. And that's a like a screening tour that I would do occasionally where I would gather a bunch of students, gather their work and we would tour. We would drive different places and, you know, go different places, show their work, allow them to, you know, discuss the work with the audience and, you know, move on. So I took about five or six students and their work down. We also had a screen, a Black Vision Silver Screen screening. Anyway, so during the workshop, a guy named Denver Fairweather, who had a production company uh, there in Belize, he asked me, you know, at the end of the workshop, he said, well, you know, would you be interested in coming back and working you know, with, with me on a, uh, you know, a, he wanted to do something more entertaining, more entertainment based. They'd been doing, uh, or he had been doing a lot of commercials and documentaries, and he wanted to do something, you know, very, you know, or more entertainment based. So I'm like, well, yeah, sure. You know, mm -hmm. if we can work it out. We'll work it out. Right. So I left uh, and we stayed in contact and I went back for the third annual film festival just to go to the film festival and hang out. And Denver and I talked some more. And so we decided that the following year, uh, which would have been 2004. Yeah, I believe it was 2004. Um, I would take a year sabbatical and I'd go down there and we would do, you know, do a production. Now, his initial idea was to actually uh, do a, a film on a book, on a novel called Becca Lamb. Uh -huh. Becca Lamb was a very, very popular and, uh, I don't know, I guess in Belize, famous book. Um, can't remember the author's name. But it's uh -huh. about this, this young girl growing up like in 19... 50s, 1960s Belize, you know, what it was like to, to grow up. And it was a very, very, very well-written, very interesting book. But like I was telling you, to try to do a period piece, you know, you're talking about some headaches, hassles, and a whole lot of money. You know, we yeah. really probably should think about doing something, you know, a little more contemporary. Mm -hmm. And so that's where we came up with, um, oh, the original title was, oh, and let's see, No Matter What. Risking, no, we're not risking it at all. Might have been risking. No, no, it wasn't risking. Oh, it wasn't no matter what? No, no, that wasn't the original title. Oh. That wasn't the original title. Mm. Uh, That's no okay. That's okay. Against all odds. Against against all odds or against the odds. Okay. The original title was against the odds. Uh, and what ended up happening, there was a four-person production team. There was Denver, who was a producer. I was the director editor, cinematographer, blah, 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 all that te technical stuff. Then there was Kim mm -hmm. Vasquez, who was uh, the writer that I told you that had done actually the first, you know, Belize film, written and directed mm -hmm. film, you know, by Belizean. And also Adeli Ramos, who was another uh, writer. And she actually worked for the Mandela, uh, the, the, one of the, the newspapers there. Anyway, so we were the four, create, we were the four original creative team. And what we ended up doing was each of us kind of wrote profiles and characters. OK, we actually wrote up some profiles or some characters and then we went through those profiles and, you know, to, oh, this character is interesting. And oh, I like this character. I like that character. So we pulled out a bunch of characters mm -hmm. and then somehow we just, you know, melded them into this storyline, you know, into the storyline. So the base, well, we just saw the piece. Well, well no, actually, because what we just saw, Unfinished Business is a uh, one storyline, one basic storyline. 
Mm-hmm. That was cut from season four. We actually did four seasons over probably a probably a seven year period because a couple of times we went a year or two. You so know, four through. seasons consisted of how many episodes? Uh, it varied. It varied. Season one was one one hour pilot followed by four half hour episodes. Okay. Season two and season three were eight half hour episodes. And I believe season four, we tried to make eight half hour episodes. Um, But all I have left of that is basically I I actually cut that into a feature length. It's like a, a, you know, 120 minute features just one big long pieces away. I ended up cutting that. I think there Denver probably still has the actual episodes, but Mm -hmm. I cut, you know, a whole um, feature length version of that. And Unfinished Business is one storyline out of season four. Okay. So the original, okay, the original season one would basically um, dealt around um, this woman or, or a typical, what we, what we consider to be a quote unquote typical Belizean family. Their wants, needs, and desires and the, you know, headaches and hassles and, you know, what they go through on an everyday basis, you know, trying to make it and trying to survive. So again, Against the Odds was the original title. And then Denver asked someone, uh, I guess who was, you know, real kind of into culture and uh, the Garifuna, I don't know, the the Garifuna people are um, a group of, um, you know, I guess, uh, well, descendants from African, some enslaved Africans who escaped from a shipwreck. And I think originally they went Oh, where were they originally? Wasn't Trinidad. Anyway, originally they went someplace and they you know mm-hmm. lived for a while and then they got kicked out and then they got on boats and then they ended up they ended up in Belize and Honduras. But it's actually a whole you know wonderful culture and they were kind of kind of like like kind of like maroon somewhat you know where they mm-hmm. maintain you know a lot of their African yeah. cultures yeah. and language and different like that. So anyway, it was a, a representative uh, you know Garifuna family. Uh, the main character. Uh, Margaret has a cook shed. She has this little cook shed where, you know, she cooks food and people come and buys food. And there's Granny Tomasa, who's a matriarch of the family. She's trying to hold the family together. And um, Margaret has two kids. Well, two kids. Yeah. Wait a minute. There's Randy and um, Lissani. And... Actually, hmm. dang, this is a while, been a while. Because Lasani is actually supposed to be Margaret's niece, not her mother. Originally it's supposed to be her niece. Okay. Um, anyway, and so because basically what what happened was she was she when she got pregnant, uh at one time when Margaret got pregnant, her Steve, who was um, you know, the baby's daddy, he ended up running off to the states you know and ghosted her and stayed in the you know, united states for you know, 18 years or something and then basically the pilot centers around the fact that he returns to belize he returns to belize and he happen actually happens to run into lasani and her friend um yeah what's her friend's name rosetta rose rosette rose rosie no not rosie Rosanna. I, don't want, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get into the whole, the whole okay. series, but, but, right, I, but right. my interest was, um, but thank you for that. <laughs> but, mm-hmm. but my, I want to just pull you back in. Good. My interest was just how the, the relationship with the Belize. How did you, who, I mean, how did you start producing there? I mean, in terms of funding, in terms of uh, gathering the crew together, it sounded like there was no infrastructure there to even do because you were doing directing producing writing starring in i mean there was a was there a big a big push to to get people involved in this and how did how was that experience for you growing up and not really Hmm? okay all right all right again when i when i went down there to do the the no first season okay Uh um it was a thing that Again, he had a production company and he had a couple people working with him, you know, working with him. So pretty much as far as crew, it was me. And then he would usually have one guy or maybe two that would kind of work as a grip, help me set up lights or whatever, you know. But basically it was me. 
So I was wow. lighting, I was shooting. And when we shot at the end of the day, you know, I go home, I, you know, transfer the footage and I edit, you know, wake up the next day and, you know, and, and start That's again. crazy. So, um, wait, it's going to get crazier. Wait till I tell you the, the, the real <laughs> stupid stuff. Anyway, so, you know, that was that. And also, initially, it's like the language, even though it is English, but it's, it's like more patois. they call it. Creole. No, it sounds like patois a little bit. Well, they call it Creole. Them. They call it Creole, okay. but it's kind of more of a, of a patois, but you call it patois to get pissed. So okay. it's those kind of, they call it Creole. Anyway, the first day of shooting. Now, okay, now I knew, of course, I knew the script. I knew what was what and what was being said, but I didn't know what the hell they were saying. <laughs> I was on camera. I was like, I got what's going through. And whoever was talking, I would, I would get them. So it took me a while to really kind of pick up on, you know, on, on the, the dialect. But anyway, um, you know, we got it done. Now, the subsequent, um, um, the subsequent times I went back, like for season two, season three, and four, I would take students down with me. I take between, you know, two and one time I took, did I have to take four? No, I take two or three students with me. And they would actually work as crew. So, and who, also, so who put them up? The film commission put them up? No, no. I, I generally paid for the for the students. You know, I generally I mean they had to have their own pocket money, but I actually paid for, you know, their flight. And of course, Denver, you know, the producer would pay you know, to lodge them and house and housing okay. and everything. You know, so they didn't. It wasn't like they actually got paid you know a certain amount of money every week or whatever you know but uh you know we basically took care of the overall overarching you know expenses wow uh but That's you know cool. generally they, they 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 got a got a very good uh, experience but okay so so that was so that helped you know as far as the, the crew wow. is concerned in the subsequent um uh shootings but see this is this is the deal now i told denver when we were first talking about it so, okay now denver again season one one hour pilot for half hour episodes. So I said, okay, now we got to have at least two of the episodes in the can, you know, before we go to air, you know, mm -hmm. so, you know, we got plenty of time to, you know, make things happen. He said, yeah, okay, 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 fine. So we were towards the end of shooting the pilot. I think we had like one or two days left on shooting the pilot and I was editing. So I was in there editing one day mm -hmm. and he comes in and says, uh, we go on air. I can't remember when the date was. I can't even remember the date. But anyway, I come yeah. on the air, such and such date was like a week and a half away or something. Okay. I'm like, damn, I said, we're not even finished with the what the freaking right, <laughs> you know? right. We're not finished with the pilot. He said, Well, you know, something he gave me some excuse to why they had to go, whatever. I said, All right, all right, fine. So basically, so we went on and shot, you know, got the, all the shooting done. Then I was doing the editing. Now, the day it was supposed to air. Mm -hmm. Okay, premiere. It premiered on Channel Five, I believe, after the uh, after the six o'clock news. Because six wow. o'clock news down there is big time. Everybody watches six o'clock news. <laughs> so it was that day, and I was doing the tweaks. You know, putting in the last bits of music, and you know, checking for all the audio glitches and everything, and making sure everything was right. And so I don't know. About four four thirty, I started um you know burning the. Uh, the 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 air master mini dv the mini dv air master you know i started oh. burning the mini dv air master i was about halfway through i think we had just crossed the uh the second um commercial break and he stuck his head in the door said i need it he said i need it so i hit stop you know on the record button pop the tape out put in the thing you know, and i gave it to him he gave it to a uh uh um delivery guy who was on a little scooter, you know, and he delivered it to the TV station. Okay. So then I started from the um, second commercial break and I started a whole new, you know, dub tape, you know, towards the end. Okay. So it was dubbing. Wow. The TV was on behind me Wow. and the news was mm -hmm. going off. The credits were rolling on the second part of the dub master, the air master. And no matter what uh -huh. was premiering live in Belize as the credits were rolling on the second part. There was no advertisement that this is coming up after the news. No, 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 there was. There was. There was. That's another part too that, that I need to get to uh, the oh. advertisement. So remind me to get to oh, that. Oh, okay, okay. But anyway, okay. but so basically, you know, then once you know the credits, you know, had had uh, been recorded, you know, 
I stopped the tape. Mm -hmm. Again, we gave it to the um, delivery boy and he took it to the station. Got to the point, you know, commercial break came in, they switched the tapes and nobody knew the difference. Now, tell me what the next problem is. I have no idea. What? What's going to happen next? What's going to happen next Friday? This is a this was a weekly series. What's going to happen? What you do need they to have need another next the next show? Another. The <laughs> they need the next. I had one another week. another series. Another I, I had one yeah. week to produce the next half hour episode, and the next ep half hour episode, and the next half hour episode. When you say so produce, produce half to hour, shoot it or just to edit it? Were no, you shoot it, cut it, edit something? it, and have it ready for air. Oh my yes, God. I put on my little red cape and I worked that puppy. I worked, I worked, I worked wow. very hard on that. I worked very hard on that to shoot a half hour dramatic episode a week. Wow. Three weeks was, 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 Superman. But, but we got That's it done. And I will, crazy. I will admit a Denver, he's a, he was a very, really good, good um, producer. I mean, anything I needed when I needed, you know, he was there. In fact, I just talked about, I put on my little red cape. That's what I, I tell him. I joke with him all the time, man. You need to put on your little red cape and make it happen. You know, and, wow. and he'd make it happen. So, you know. That is crazy. You must have been yeah. young. Yeah, <laughs> I was. Now, I wouldn't want to do that today, okay? Oh my Don't God. get me wrong. That's crazy. Shoot, that today, I, I, that, that would take me out today, I think. But I did tell him, too, though. I said, it's a shame that, you know, the timing was so kind of, you know, off that I was, because I don't know, I guess I was in my what? I guess I had to be in my 50s. Mm -hmm. I'd be in my wow. 50s. And by the time I said, man, I said, if I was here 20 years ago, 30 years ago, so if I was your age now, that you, because he was probably, he's about 20 years younger, you know, I said, man, I said, we'd run this place. We'd run it. But anyway, wow. that was then. But you had mentioned uh, commercials. You know, mm -hmm. that's kind of how we made our money was he would go, he would sell the commercial space and advertising. Mm -hmm. you no, know, then I guess he would, you know, actually buy airspace on the TV channels, you know. And, so if it um, aired right after the news, that must have really been big for um for natives there. Oh, oh, uh, Belizeans love no matter what. Native I mean, Belize. people tell us they say they would run home on a, a Friday night in order to 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 see no matter what. You know, when we were in season, oh, when wow. we were doing it, everybody is loved. In fact. The thing is, you know, I mean, if as popular as it was in Belize, okay, if we had done something like that here in America or something in a bigger market, oh, uh, we'd have, because I think Belize only has like, I think a population of like 150,000, wow. I believe. Yeah, so, small. That's, that's, yeah, small. And so that's one of the things he always said. He said that, that the market, you know, is not big enough to really, you know, financially, you know, support, you know. Things on only to a certain. But I'm just level. wondering. I'm just wondering. It could have still been circulated in other parts of Central America. It could have been circulated. I would have thought in other parts of Central. Yeah, America. Yeah, you would think. You would think. And and I mean, I tried. Okay, I tried. You know, I tried to get a couple things. A couple of times, I I had some leads, and I get them to him. You know, but nothing would happen. I don't know if it was he wouldn't follow through, or there wow. wasn't enough money involved, or what. But but it, it 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 didn't it didn't didn't really play out very well and even with that just like like with um unfinished business i've got like two other um kind of standalone you know pieces that i cut storylines i cut out one's called tomasa in time where um granny tomasa goes down to visit family in punta gorda and finds that her niece is in a, an abusive relationship that's like a 10 minute mm -hmm. piece, standalone piece. And they also have um, Dim Valley's Day, which deals with um, <clears throat> Randy, who's Margaret's son. And, uh, you know, he wants to be a rapper. He wants to be, you know, a music and music and everything. And he there's a couple of friends that get involved with some some gangs and some drug dealers and everything. And he's with them one night and something goes down and then they go to jail and they think that he snitched on them. So they break out of jail. Then they come, you know, come to, to seek revenge on him. So that's I mean, this was like this was like a soap opera, really. It was like, yeah, a, a yeah, 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 very much, very much. Yeah. Anyway, so those two. But. And I submitted those to various film festivals. I couldn't get them suckers in no film festivals. Mm -hmm. You know, there's only a few, a few, a couple of film festivals that that would even accept them. Which, and a couple of them were even, you know, Caribbean film festivals. So yeah. I was like, God dang! And then of course the uh, entry fees got a bit high, so I just kind of pulled back from that. Yeah. But um, yeah, 
Uh, I I had hoped that you know we could have gotten a lot more um, of a you know international push on it, uh, yeah. you know, but 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 it never happened, you know. Uh, but another yeah. interesting thing, a positive thing from a production standpoint for me was again, you know, in, in the commercials, the advertising, you know, because along with selling the advertising space, we would also shoot the commercials. And of course, I would direct and shoot the commercials and everything. Wow. And, you know, it's nice to kind of, you know, you watching TV and pop, you know, there's your work up on the screen, <laughs> up on the screen, you know, up on the screen, you know. Wow. And um, that's, that's kind of nice. You know, you finish something today and tonight, you know, it's on air. You know, I think that's that kind of difficult wild. to do here. I mean, this this to me is, I mean, your your experience is really a testament to thinking outside of the USA, USA box. You know, mm -hmm. filmmakers have the ability to partner with other countries somehow and bring mm -hmm. things into fruition, especially yeah, those good. who are developed in the whole film industry. That may be. But was that was that an issue? Getting like actors uh were, were a lot of them laymen or did they, were they really professional actors um how did that work no, gathering no, most, people to actually be in the series no most of those actors that was their first time acting that was their first time acting now steve the guy that played steve in the in season one uh he had actually done some stage some theatrical acting mm -hmm. some acting on stage but pretty much everybody else they they'd never acted before uh and basically we, we would just just hold auditions you know we'd hold auditions and people would come, people would, you know, try out, you know, we'd give them the sides, they'd read the lines and interact. And we, you know, we pull who we thought were, were the best people. And I was very impressed with the talent that they had down there, you know, uh -huh. and we, I was very impressed with the talent. They, they had some talented people down there that really kind of, you know, showed up and put out for us, you know, so I was, wow. I was, I was. I'm just crazy. thinking that adds to the pressure of having to do a daily, a weekly production, shoot it and all that when you have untrained <laughs> I'm not. Act. I'm not saying. I'm I mean, to me, that would just easy. add to my pressure and my. Oof. Yeah, yeah. I'm Oof, not saying it Lord, was easy, that sounds but um, so... you know, we we got it done. We got it done. That's 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 what I got to say about it. And of course, after that, that after good. the fact, which was you know many years after, we also did the first uh, episodic sitcom of Blees, a piece huh. called called uh, Living Me Life. A piece called Living Me Life, but it didn't take off as well. And okay. I got to make, in fact, I was just watching the pilot or I started watching the pilot the other day. I didn't even finish it, but it just, it didn't have the uh -huh. um, that no matter what did, you know, it just didn't wow. quite come together. It didn't quite come together as well. Wow. Yeah. That but, That is pretty amazing. I didn't know the story behind the whole Belizean <laughs> episodes, drama. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also been nice because, of course, you know, in the process, you know, I've met some people, you know, in Belize and, you know, I'm still, you know, have the, you know, friendship with Denver, you know, with the the, the producer. And I still go back and forth, you know, even though there's we're not, not doing any productions, I still mm -hmm. go down there and hang out, mm -hmm. you know. And it's also amazing, too, because it's like I'll be going for a while and then just just like. You know, like when I said life wasn't very good and Belize just started talking about come to Belize, come to right, Belize. Right, right. I feel sometimes like, you know, come back to Belize. You know, sometimes like I just start missing it, you know, and it's just like, you know, come back, come back. Oh, you know, I love like, Belize. You know, like, I, went, I had one visit there and I'm like, I want to go back. Yeah. I loved it. Well, I mean, it's not the tropical paradise that, you know, I would wish for. Mm -hmm. You know, because I mean, there's there's a lot of crime, a lot of violence, drugs, poverty, poverty down there. I think you know hurts me a lot more than 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 you know. But anyway, you know, it's 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 not it's not the paradise. You know, but mm -hmm. the people are wonderful. Yeah. You know, the the countryside in actually Belize in the mainland. You know, because it's not an mm -hmm. island. You know, it's it's just south of Mexico. Mm -hmm. You know, near uh, Honduras and Guatemala down around there. Um, but the keys, some of the keys and some of the islands are really nice, you know, and there's a place called Placencia, which is down south. Mm -hmm. Now, when I first saw Placencia, Placencia reminded me of what I imagined Belize to look like. You know, it's got a lot of more, you know, the beach and the palm trees and then the kind of the laid back uh -huh. kind of a thing, you know, so Placencia was, was really nice. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it's just something about Belize that when I'm down there, it's a whole different 
vibe. Reality, you know, it's just yeah. a, a whole different reality, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and it's really nice. It's really nice. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's a great legacy to have, just to have your first uh, yeah. series, television, dramatic television series in Belize. That's amazing. Yeah. But so, again, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed that, like I said, this, like you mentioned, you know, that it didn't take off broader than Belize. Like I said that we couldn't have got, I mean, we did get it to, I got it to um, Antigua. I met some people in Antigua who had a thing in the show in, in, in Antigua. Um, there was, oh, what was that other? Uh, Trinidad. I got it down okay. in Trinidad. Season one was, was shown in Trinidad. No matter what. <laughs> yeah. And someone else. Um, but um, I'm just, it's, I'm disappointed again that it didn't have a bigger worldwide splash. And, and to this point, to this day, I cannot say you know, because every time I went and came back, I never came back financially, you know, better off because I never I never made any money off of it. You know, yeah. I, mean, I would yeah. make you know, like living expenses and everything. But it wasn't like I come back with 200, 500, a couple thousand dollars in my pocket. That never happened. You know, in fact, you know, most of the time, especially when mm -hmm. I would take the students, I, I you know, out of my pocket, you know, I'd come back as, at a loss. So I never really benefit. I never benefited financially from the piece or I haven't mm -hmm. as of yet. Um, and it's unfortunate that I can't say that I could reach point to one additional opportunity that came directly from my experience with no matter what, you okay. know, like, oh yeah, man, I saw you're no matter what, come here and, you know, work with yeah. me, here yeah. do this. I want to hire you, you know, you know, none of that, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's gotten me no additional work. Uh -huh. You know, yeah. so that's it. Was uh, a hell of it sounds like a hell of an experience, though. So. Oh, that that it is, that it is, and I'm thinking, hoping, sure, I'm one day, so one day somebody's gonna long after I'm gone and turn to dust. Somebody go, woo, no matter what, and, <laughs> there, and da 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 da. You know, they probably gonna blow it up. You know. Yeah. But um, well, I, you know, tell, I mean, you're retired, retired a film professor from Howard. University, graduate of UCLA, a native of is Ohio, right? Iowa. Were you a native? Ohio, yeah. Tell us a little bit about your filmmaking no, Iowa. journey, like how you. Iowa. Iowa. I know. I, I was thinking. I was thinking Ohio, but Iowa. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your filmmaker yeah. journey, like like how you guys got started with filmmaking. Who was your inspiration? Um, just take us back to. The okay. In a nutshell. How you even got to UCLA? I mean, did you practice in high well, school, junior high? I mean, how did you get started? Well, well, I never intended to be a filmmaker, of course, starting off. You know, I was going to be an astronaut at one time. And then I was, you know, I played guitar and bass. And then I was going to be in music. And my dad, my dad had a super 8 millimeter movie camera. Well, first he had a regular 8 millimeter movie camera. That he would mm -hmm. shoot home movies with and he had a super eight movie camera and i just remember i used to always love that you know after he shot some movies and he'd get them printed and then you know we bring them home he'd put them on the projector he projecting just how exciting you know that was you know actually you know seeing myself and seeing my family you know up on the screen and everything mm -hmm. and this was i was probably about six seven or eight you know around that time and <clears throat> what the the genesis of my film journey was was that uh when i was a it was the summer before my junior year in high school. Mm -hmm. And my sister had just finished her freshman year at the University of Iowa in journalism. And she came home. She said, I'm going to go buy a dark room. You want to come with me? So I said, yeah, sure. Why not? So I'm thinking a dark room. I'm thinking it's going to be some big box kind of a thing, you know, some big <laughs> box, you know, it's uh -huh. dark, you know, once you close up the doors and everything. Anyway, so I think we went to, can't remember where we went. We went somewhere and she bought, you know, dark room. She bought like the enlarger and the trays and the chemicals and all that, you know, to print, to process black and white, pro process and print black and white film, you know, 35 mm -hmm. millimeter film. And so, you know, we took it home and we actually set it up initially in the garage. You mm -hmm. know, so we could only, only use it at night, you know, and we set up in the garage. And so that night, you know, when it got dark, she had the little red, you know, light and everything, safety light and everything. And so I stood back and watched her, you know, and she, you know, took this after she made up the chemicals and stuff, had these trays and she took this little white piece of paper. Now, really, you got to realize this is again, this is 74 probably. This is probably 74, 
75. So this was before they had, you know, the Polaroids. When you used to take the Polaroids, you'd come out and you could stand there and watch yeah. the image appear. That that didn't exist, okay? That wasn't there, okay? Wow. So anyway, so she took this little white piece of paper, put it on the easel, you know, first, you know, she put the negative in the tray and focused it and put the little white piece of paper. She turned on the light, turned the light off. Mm -hmm. This little white piece of paper put in this water looking stuff and started yeah. shaking it around, right? So again, I had no idea what she was doing. But when that image appeared on that white piece of paper, I was hooked. The film bug bit me hard on the butt. I mean, yeah. I was hooked. That was magic. That, that was probably, that was the closest thing to magic I'd ever seen. Wow. And I think she probably used that dark room maybe twice. And I would be out there dang near every night, every other night, and out there, you know, just just doing it, you know, with some negatives that she had. Okay, I didn't have any of my own negatives or any of my own stuff. I would just be printing up stuff she had. Wow. And then, ironically, when I got back to school in the fall, again, 11th grade, I had a photography class on my schedule that to this day, I do not remember signing up for. Wow. Okay, I did not sign up for that class. I don't know how I got it, but I had a photography class. So um, I took photography and Mr. Casina, he was this older, this older guy. I, I love Mr. Casina. He, he, he was the type of teacher that he'd make you answer your own question. If you ask him a question, he'd ask you a question. And then you'd answer, he'd ask you another question. By the time he finished, you'd answer your own question. All your questions. Yeah, your own try. I tried to do that at Howard, but it didn't work. That <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, you know, again, I got into to photography. And so when I went to college, uh, start off at University of Iowa, I spent my freshman, sophomore year at University of Iowa. But when mm -hmm. I first went, I was under the, elect the engineering program, you know, mm -hmm. because I went to Des Moines Technical High in Des Moines, and I was in the uh, communications electronics uh, core area. Okay. And so I you know, thought I'd be a, an engineer. But after one semester of engineering courses, I just realized nah, that that just, just was not it. That just did not thrill me. But when I thought about being a photographer, you know, and and, and shooting, being on the beach, shooting a uh, Sports Illustrated swimsuit cover, you know, nah, that 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 kind of gave me some excitement. So anyway, so I decided that, you know, I would change my major from engineering to, um, well, I had to change it to art because University of Iowa did not have photography, you know, as a major, but they did have photography classes through the art program. So I changed my major to art, you know, took a lot of art classes and the one or two photography classes that they had. But then I just felt like that wasn't enough. So I wanted to, you know, transfer to somewhere that had, you know, photography. And so I ended up transferring to Arizona State uh, in Tempe, Arizona and got my B.A. in uh, art with an emphasis in photography. Uh, at the time, um, you know, I was about to graduate. I had um, worked. I worked. Um, I, I went to school part. The last year I went to school, or actually the last two years, mm -hmm. I went to school part time and I worked full time. And I knew that I wasn't ready to punch a time clock. So, you know, I thought, OK, well, you know, I probably should go to grad school. And so I was talking to my roommate at the time, one of my fraternity brothers named Walter Venerable. Mm -hmm. And um he had just been accepted in the dental program at UCLA. And so he said, he said, well, you know, I heard UCLA has the number one film school in the, in the nation, you know, and a little bell went off in my head, you know, a little light went off. I said, oh yeah, that sounds interesting. You know? So I thought about going to film school and I um, think I had already applied yeah, I had already applied to film school to UCLA. I, I just put all my eggs in one basket. That was the only film school I applied to. And I had met, I actually had a girlfriend who lived in LA at the time while I was going to um, Arizona State. And her sister was a student at UCLA. And I was out there visiting one time and her sister took me to uh, meet this guy that worked in the um, tech center named Abdul. Mm -hmm. And so we talked and talked to Abdul. He said, well, you know what to show me? He said, you need, you should go talk to Toshomi Gabriel. He was one of the professors, you know, so you should go talk to Toshomi Gabriel. He was actually Ethiopian, you know, and he said, he told me where his office was and everything, you know, so I went, I knocked on the door and thank God, you know, um, you know, he was there. So he opened the door, you know, introduced myself, told, my, told him I had applied and, and we talked for a little bit, you know, so, you know, he said, yeah, well, I'll, I'll keep an eye out, you know, keep an eye out for your, 
Mm-hmm. Anyway, so I went on back home, back to Iowa. I was actually in Iowa at the time because I had already graduated and I was back in Iowa working with my dad. Anyway, um, and so I get this letter from UCLA. I open it and it said, no, nah, Negro, we don't want you. So I'm like, oh, shit. Wow. Again, again, this was, you know, all my eggs in that one basket. So I'm like, okay, what am I going to do now? Anyway, so, you know, I went on about my business. And strangely enough, uh, probably, probably maybe about a month later, I come in from work with my dad. And um, like I've been working with my dad all god dang day. OK, he, he had a janitorial mm-hmm. service and he also did a window washing, a, a residential window washing. I think we were mm-hmm. on a residential window washing job. But anyway, I come in and my little sister asked me, she says, did dad tell you? She said, congratulations. Did dad tell you? I said, tell me, tell me what? He said, UCLA called. You got into film school. I said, well, mm-hmm. I said, no, dad didn't say nothing. So about that time, dad came up the stairs. I said, dad, what's this about UCLA calling? He said, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, Tishma, Tishma. I said, to show me? He said, yeah, yeah, to show me called. He said, you got into film school and everything. You know, so I called to show me and, you know, yeah, you know, I got it. Mm-hmm. Got me in. So what was odd about this, and again, mm-hmm. this is why I thought that God put me on this planet to make movies. I thought that for many, many, many years. I don't know. For, I, don't, I don't know now because hey, Hollywood still. You retired like, hey, too. Well, I mean, but you, did you you knew about the whole independent thing because you were following UCLA, the LA Rebellion filmmakers, so you knew no, that no, there I'm, was an alternative. I am a I am a LA Rebellion filmmaker. <laughs> that was you. You got out in the seventies. No, 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 no. That was that was that was seventy like seventy eight through eighty four, eighty five. Oh, I, I, know, I didn't know it went through the, to the 80s. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I'm I'm in the second wave of the UCLA rebellion. Okay. So yeah, I I'm a rebellion filmmaker. And again, this was before you know I had ever. Well, actually, I did. I had my own Super 8 millimeter camera, so I had done a couple of Super 8 millimeter uh-huh. things that I played around with. But you know, whether I would have, if I never gotten into film school at UCLA, whether I would have followed up and applied someplace else or continued to try, I don't I don't know. I'm not sure if I would have even taking that route you know uh-huh. but again oddly enough what ended up happening was you know years a couple years later after i'd been there a while i was talking to show me at one time and he said what happened was he said that a couple of the other faculty members who were on the the selection committee came to him and some guy whose daddy or whose uncle was some big mucky muck in hollywood had been rejected and he they came to him and said you know hey we need your vote on this guy, you know? And he said, he told him, said, I'll vote for your guy if you vote for my guy. So that's how I got into film school at UCLA. It was wow. some politics, <laughs> some wow. politics and politics. Hey, whatever works, man. Hey, hey, yeah. Whatever yeah. works. But I'm actually, sure, I, I mean, that, I'm sure that, that experience just gave you, I mean, you just had a one track mind about, about just, just wanting to work for Hollywood initially, you no? Know? And then going to UCLA, that gives you an did they give you an alternative uh, to hey, there's black independent filmmaking as an option. I mean, because a lot of people don't know that there's black independent it, filmmaking or black stories, or black festivals. But, but in in eighty one, when I was first got there, 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 there was no black independent filmmaking. I mean, we had just missed the black exploitation era, you know, which went from seventy one to seventy six. Well, from seventy six mm-hmm. on. There were no black, as far as I knew, you know, there were no black people making movies. There was no, no, no black independent, you know, route to go to. In fact, I always found it anyway, because I would talk to, you know, some of my white, you know, students that I was going to school with. And they got, uh-huh. oh, I don't, know I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to do this. And I think I'm going to do that. And, and I'm going to try to, you know, and it's like they had no idea what they wanted to do. And yet the clear, the, the, the road was clear, you know. The road, they saw no obstacles, no stumbling blocks, no nothing. All I saw was hurdles and obstacles and doors that were, you know, it's like, because at the time, there was nobody that looked like me that was out there making movies at the time, you know? So I'm constantly mm-hmm. thinking, how am I going to, you know, do what I want to do when there's nobody that looks like me doing it or being allowed to do it, mm-hmm. you know? And that's what was going through my head. All I saw was roadblocks and hurdles and all this shit. I'm gonna have to figure out a way around. Where again, you know, the my 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 you know Caucasian colleagues, you know, in film school. I mean, they just you know, it was just just you know, world's the limit, you know. Right, and so right. um, I did what I needed to do, and you know, got through. I actually 
it was a two year program that I did in four years. Okay. Wow. Because mm -hmm. after the two years, I just said, I, I haven't learned enough. I haven't learned enough, you know? So I stayed another year and I took more classes. And I made more films, got more experience, you know? And then I still felt I had learned enough. So I took a fourth year. But that fourth year, faculty kind of, they must look around and say, what the hell is he doing still here? And their attitudes just shifted and changed. So I said, oh, it's time to go. It's time to go. So, wow. so you needed 72 units to graduate with a, with an MFA in, in film production. I graduated with 141. Wow. And that... Yes. That that folks is why he did the whole series of <laughs> of no matter what he could do everything. Yeah, well, one of the things that wow. I do appreciate, well, I did do it. Yeah, I still appreciate. I do appreciate about UCLA was because you know it was UCLA and USC. Right. You know, depending on who you talk to, and then sometimes NYU will come in. You know, as far as film schools. See, but UCLA was like, all right, you know, you're here. Glad you're here. Here's the equipment. Here, go do it. You know, and everything was up to you. You know, you had to get the budget. You had to get the crew. You had to you know, reserve the film. You know, you, you know, everything was you, mm -hmm. you know. And so because of that, I was able to learn lighting and camera and sound. And I mean, all aspects of production. You know, I made sure that there was no avenue of television film production that I didn't have at least a grip on. Wow. Okay. Whereas from what I understand at USC, they say USC pretty much was more like the industry, was like Hollywood. And they everything was packaged. They would they would have packaged projects. So basically they say, you know, they knew who the best directors were, who the best cinematographers were, editors, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore they would put packages together, you know. And so I think if I was at, at some place like USC, I doubt seriously if I could have done what I did in Belize with no matter what, because again, they say, Oh, you're the director. And then here's your cinematographer, here's your editor, right, here's your right, sound right. person, you know, and they, you know, they put everything together. So I would not have been able to get my hands and get experience on, on all elements, you know, wow. production like I did. Wow. And that was also something that I purposely did. Like I said, you know, I realized, you know, that it take, took a lot of money to make film. You know, I didn't have a lot of money. So like, mm -hmm. what you going to do? Well, if you can do it yourself, guess what? You don't have to pay somebody else to do it, mm -hmm. you know, so figure yeah. that out. And then I also recall that was very frustrating to me was video when video first started coming out, you know, video was not respected at all, you know, in the early days, you know, cause I would do a peek cause I realized no, um, my feature film, my feature or my, what's it called my thesis project, my UCLA thesis project originally was going to be a feature length film called light of the world, which was a contemporary gospel musical that I was going to do. And I went into one day of production and had to pull the plug because I knew that, you know, I didn't have the financial resources or anything to back it up. I had bit off more than I could chew. You know, I was trying to do all this big feature film thing all by my little lonesome self. And it wasn't a little lonesome self project. It was a big project. So I crashed and burned on it, cried for a couple of weeks and, um, you know, then realized again, you know, you need money. And then that's when somebody uh, told me, uh, they said, well, you know, you can do, you know, make movies or, you know, you can do work in video for a fraction of the cost, you know, that it, that it takes, you know, to do film. So I think that was like into my third, no, no my yeah, end of my third year going into my fourth year. So that's when I started taking video classes before then I had hadn't taken any video classes other than some of the studio, you know, multi-camera production classes. So I started taking some video classes. I started doing work in video, you know. And I would do the piece, I'd do some work and I'd send it out, you know, to, you know, to some of the, 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 the producers in Hollywood, different things. Oh, it's great. Oh, it's wonderful. Oh, it's financial. But it's video, you know, I do another. Oh, it's great. Oh, it's wonderful. Oh, it's so intense. But it's video, you know, and it's like, what, what, don't you think if I could do this with no money and video, right? can't you imagine what I could do with right. some money and some film? Right. Now, unless they were just smoke, blowing smoke, you know, which I don't think they were doing, because like I said, I, I believe I've done some good work, you know, in my wow. career. Um, but again, I, I was just very frustrated, you know, that it's like they could not, you know, make that transition. Right. And it's almost like if it's not film, if it's it not exactly what we want to see, you know, it, it, there's no no middle ground. There's there's yeah. no 
yeah. no other way to look at anything, you know. So mm -hmm. that was that was very very um frustrating. Well, what, what's your what what type of film genres do you like, like to produce? I see drama. Uh, you said you did a horror film. You've done a number of shorts. And what what type do genres do you like to to do most? I can't, I, I can't say I've got a something I prefer. To be perfectly honest, I did a horror film, but I don't like horror. <laughs> you know, that's not something I necessarily want to do again or want to be known for. But the reason I did a horror film at the mm -hmm. time was, like I said, I had done all this, you know, work. I had all the, done this, all this work in video, you know, won awards, you know. Um, again, I sent it out, you know, tried to, you know, use it as a stepping stone. But they said, oh, but it's video, but it's video. So I knew I had to do something in film. You know, and I figured that, you know, okay, whatever I did in film, I had to be able to sell it. Right. So I had read somewhere that said that there has not been a horror film made that has not made money. They say every four horror film ever made has made a profit, has made money because there is a, uh, there's an audience for it. There is a diehard audience for it that just loves, you know, the horror film. So that's why I did um, Embalmer, you know, and it was true. I mean, I still haven't made any money from Embalmer. I got ripped off from Embalmer. Like I was mentioning, you know, um, and when I was feeling depressed and, you know, before I went to Belize, um, mm -hmm. I had gotten distribution, supposedly distribution from Embalmer uh, from this company called Spectrum Films. They were down in Texas. Okay. Yeah, and I was Spectrum. supposed to get, uh, I was supposed to get, yeah, they were in Austin, I believe. Hmm, yep. Not San Antonio. Now, if they were in San Antonio. Oh, no, we have Spectrum. Spectrum is part of Time Warner now. So it's Spectrum. Spectrum mm, News, Spectrum. Yeah, we have no, that now. Well, I'm sure it's Spectrum, but I'm pretty sure it's not the same people. Oh, I'm okay. pretty sure it's not the same people or the same company. Okay. Anyway, I'm sure if it was, was San Antonio, they wouldn't have ripped me off because people in San Antonio don't do that kind of thing, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, I was supposed to get 50% of the net. All right. So, you know, they, you know, a year or so had gone by and I still had gotten no paperwork, no nothing. Finally, you know, I kept calling, calling, calling. Finally, they sent me, you know, the 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 stitch, the paperwork or whatever, the numbers. It has supposedly grossed mm -hmm. over a hundred thousand dollars. I made it for probably between 25 and 30 grand. Okay, that's what I put into it. And it grossed over a hundred dollars. I'm a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. And then of course they had all their fees, this, that, and everything that they took out. So net was like $33,000 something. So I was supposed to get 50% of that, which was, was supposed to be like $12,800. Okay. So they said, oh, yeah, the check will be there. You know, we'll send you a check, da, da, da. Well, a week or two go by, no check. I call, oh, yeah, yeah, it's coming, it's coming. You know, another couple of weeks, you know, go by, no check. Finally, one day, of course, I call, and it's the number you have reached has been disconnected. So. Of course, I realized it. All right, I just been you know, and they turned, they rolled into another company called Latter Day Films or something. I guess so they can go and rip off some other folks. Wow. But I finally had to let it go because see, my next piece was going to be a snuff film. You know what a snuff film is, right? Mm -hmm. I was snuff? Going to a, snuff, a snuff film. Is and that I was like fluff? Pass, and I, huh? Like is in is snuff as in fluff film? What's a snuff? No film? snuff. What is that? A snuff film is when you actually, truly, honestly kill somebody in the mother scratcher. Oh. Okay. okay, that's a snuff film. They are illegal, highly illegal. Huh. But I was going to do a snuff film, and I was going to cast the two leading witches that ripped me off in the lead roles. Anyway, so it was starting to get to me, so I decided to let it go. <laughs> I decided to let it go, but nah, it it was it was very very disheartening. But I also kicked myself too because I mean I because I actually got I actually had my my bankruptcy lawyer, the lawyer that you know took me through bankruptcy. I had her write them a letter, and that's how I find actually finally got you know some got everything I needed from them. But what I should have did was had them write her a letter, call and say, look, on such and such a date, you know, my client will be at your offices, have his check. That's what I should have done. That's what I should have done. But, you know, I actually, I just at the time, now that I think about it, I just, and this is truly, this is how it happened. I had just gotten saved, actually, you know, and I was into this little spiritual quest thing. And I'm like, you know, all right, Lord, you know, Lord, you know, 
it's in your hands. Or, you know, I, I yeah, give it to you. Yeah. You, know, da, da, da. you know, and really that's that's why I didn't get on a plane and go down there. Mm. If I was in that plane, I went and got my money. But I'm like, Lord, it's in your hands. Well, I never got my money, so mm -hmm. you know, Lord must still have it or somebody. Whoever <laughs> got it, got it. I never got it. So so now that you're retired, what's next on your plate as far as filmmaking, directing? You have any plans to do anything else? I know the big hurdle is always money, trying to get the yeah. funds together. But the world has, has gotten much smaller and technology has gotten much larger since you started out. So any any other plans, well, series or films? Other than going fishing and catching fish as much as I can so I can eat. <laughs> mm. No, my major plan, there's, 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 Actually, there's a lot of things I want to do that I plan to do. But Light of the World, I mentioned Light of the World, my contemporary gospel musical. I still want to do that. I want to do, do that so bad. Um, and I actually want to do two different versions. The original version uh, was a period piece. I actually wrote it when I was in film school at UCLA. So it would take place back in the early 1980s um, in LA, you know, West Coast, and all black cast. Then I would want to do another piece, take the same script and adapt it, you know, wh whoever would direct it, you know, have it adapted. That would be East Coast with a multicultural cast and it would be contemporary. And yeah. I like to do both of those films simultaneously. As crazy oh, as it cool. may sound. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's one. And then there's um, another kind of a, uh, I call it a, a Caribbean voodoo murder mystery that I wanted mm -hmm. to call Clutches. And I'd work with uh, Hammer Films out of Antigua. I was director of photography on their film called um, The Skin mm -hmm. back in the late 90s. And I'd like to work with them again. It's a husband and wife um, uh, production team. She produces, he directs um, okay. Howard and Mitzi Allen. And uh, they, they, they do good work. They do good work. So I'd like to work with them to do this Caribbean uh, voodoo murder mystery. So that's something I'd like to I, do. I did want to mention also that you you have written a book and you would you have, you have that handy? Because I should have I should have um, I should have I should have had yeah. that. I should okay, yes. All right. Yes, okay. um, yeah, I am an author and I have a couple self-published novels. I've still been that's something that's been very frustrating is not being able to get any traction, you know, on my novels work. Right, this is tears. And basically, I originally wrote it as a screenplay while I was at UCLA, and it deals with uh, racism. Tears is an acronym for Teach Everybody All Racism Sucks. Mm. And it's got a lot to do with my experiences growing up in Iowa. I always say growing up in Iowa was 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 wonderful. I mean, because basically, I mean, we, there wasn't really a large drug problem, wasn't a gang problem, wasn't a lot of violence and theft and a whole bunch of stuff. You know, but um, um, anyway, but racism, racism undercut all that, undercut all, everything. And so I originally wrote it again uh, as a screenplay, realized, of course, I didn't have the money, you know, to um, do it as a screenplay. So I decided to, you know, novelize it. Uh, this version here, Cry Tough, same basic story, um, only... This one is written real time and you actually go home with the white characters and find out, you know, how they act and how they feel and what happened. The, my original concept was that, you know, it was like a mirror effect, you know, white people do this, black folks react like that. You know, black folks do this, white folks react like that. And so with Cry Tough, um, I had a friend of mine, he, he was, who's also an author. I read his new manuscript and he read Tears. And, you know, or cry tough. He read cry tough. And he said that, you know, with him being white, you know, he said, you know, when I, when I was with the black story, he said he was right there. Everything was right there. He said, but whenever I got to the white story, he just couldn't believe it. It just wasn't believable to him. It just didn't work, you know, which is quite possible. I mean, I'm not white. This is my imagination of how they feel, how they think, whatever, you know, or, you know, maybe it was more of a kind of like this, uh, this critical race theory and you know people just don't want to think about it because it's too real and they well they, don't they ban it, it and they huh? ban like that here in texas Ugh, yeah yeah that's what i'm saying so 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 was it no, not real critical, or was it just the one to deal with just, the guilt and reality this. i don't know but anyway he suggested that i stay with the black story which is what i ended up doing you know in in tears um but the but initial no, you, concept the, for the, tears was you know from you know, the birth of a nation, D.W. Griffith's birth of a nation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, 1915. 
which basically is say had done so much to undermine and destroy race relations around the world. My thought while I was in film school, I said, well, if a film could have so much damage, you know, and do so much that's so terrible, another film should be able to come through and, you know, and, and, and fix it, Correct. you know? One film could do so bad, another film should be able to come and, and, and heal, you know? So that's my intent for, te for tears. I want tears to be the healing balm that finally helps that, you know, racial sore to, to mend and heal because no one seems to be wanting to do that right now. But anyway, that's tears. And then this is the No, Honey in Man's addition son. to that, it was also the, the, 100, the 100 influential um Oh, films. the 50 most influential black films. 50. Right. Yeah, that was another I mean, one that I you said you used I wasn't even thinking about that one. <laughs> but anyway, I, that's these are my I knew. I, I, That's the one I oh, was thinking about. Oh, you didn't know about these? Have that one handy. I'll have to okay, that well, I'm going to have one. But anyway, this is uh, the, the Honey Man's Son. And it is actually based, it was inspired by, I had a good friend named Joel Flewellen, who was an actor, veteran actor in Hollywood, like back in the 50s and 60s and on up. In fact, mm -hmm. um, the movie A Raisin in the Sun, movie Raising the Sun with Sidney Poitier. Yeah. Remember when the guy runs off with the money? Yeah. And I think his name was Bobo or whatever. He comes back and tells Sidney that the money gone. Sidney grabs him and slaps him around. That was Mr. Flewellen. Anyway, Mr. Flew, he would tell me these stories about when he was a kid down in Louisiana. And so the Honey Man's son uh, pretty much, you know, is based off of some of the stories that he told. And um, you know what a Honey Man was? No. You have no idea? I'm thinking so, well, it's like a sugar daddy. I don't know. <laughs> that's what most I'm, people think. But I'm no, thinking this like is, a sugar again, daddy. This is back, back in the, the, the mid to late 1930s, you know, after the Great Depression, before the, the, WW, the WPA started their works projects and started putting in indoor plumbing and indoor toilets, and people mm -hmm. had outhouses. Right. And the honey man would come along on the honey wagon to empty out the honey pots. Okay, so the main character, Reggie, Reginald Tigris, he's the honey man's son, and he's been working with his daddy, you know, since you know, he was, you know, seven. And when he started working with him, of course, he became an outcast and a pariah, you know, because nobody wanted to work with the little kid that went around, you know, emptying out outhouses. And so now his father, he's 17, about to graduate from high school. His father wants to retire and pass the business down to him because he actually uh, inherited the business from his father. And of course, Reggie doesn't want that. Reggie wants to go to school. He wants to go to college. And then a racial incident in town, uh, there's a lynch mob after him. So he has to hop a freight train and get out of town. He decides to go search for his mother in, uh, in New York. So that's the basic story about the honey man's son. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, how can people reach you and, and reach and get, get a hold of your books, your films, and where, where can we find you? Uh, my email is torianob1958 at iCloud.com, just like it said on there, Toriano, S Toriano, Toriano B1958 at iCloud.com. And um, yes, that would be the best way to reach out. Yeah, but there is also the the, the resource book, uh, The 50 Most Influential Black Films that I co-wrote with my sister, Dr. Venice Berry, who um, teaches that, that's on, That Ohio. stays on Amazon, right? The 50 Most Influential Black yeah, Films. Yeah, I mean, they've they got a lot of, you know, books and a lot of, like, um, resells, resell books. But they only did one printing, which I'm very really disappointed in. I mean, because they sold out. You know, I think they did, like, a 5,000 printing that they sold out on. But they never did a second printing, which is very disappointing. Oh, wow. And then we that's also cool. did a uh, Historical Dictionary of African American Cinema. You know, which is more of a of a dictionary and um you know but but that one is like it's weird because when we, when we did the 50 most influential i mean it had an impact i mean you know people would call we do interviews and you know of course we were able to do book signings and everything because you know it was a smaller book and of course you know it was you know affordable um uh -huh. the historical dictionary of african-american cinema they put like a 90 dollars price tag on that sucker you know so we couldn't really do book signings and i mean it's had to, to, to my knowledge no no impact i mean there's been no phone calls no emails yeah. nobody wanting to interview the us the ability of it of getting it probably was so expensive that people didn't yeah really well, whatever but like it. it just it just had no no impact unfortunately yeah. which is unfortunate. but i thank you for, for uh letting me
letting us show your work and, and talking with us and also for judging our at our film festival. We appreciate you. That's good. That's good. Well, thank Those you, sir. All right. Well, thank you so Take much. Take care. Ada. We'll talk to you. Hey, all right. be blessed. All right. You too. Bye-bye.